കരുണാർണവമായി കരുതഗതി നൽകും അരുണാചല ശിവം ബുദ്ധി അഹങ്കാരം പുലംബെയ്തവൂങ്കും മദ്ദീതയം താൻ മറയവനും ആലും Namaste Richard Namaste Adya Shanti I really enjoyed these conversations I look forward to it all week long Yes I enjoy it as well uh for me most of the conversations like this I have uh I'm somewhat in a role of a teacher even though I don't see myself as a teacher in rarely is it uh you know kind of on the level that we have which is you know two people who are pretty knowledgeable about this stuff uh talking back and forth and in my experience that's pretty rare mine too and i appreciate it yeah it really makes a difference for me just to have somebody to talk to on an equal level uh-huh me too so anyway i appreciate it and uh it's fun yeah and you know one of the things about talking like this is that uh sometimes you hear yourself saying things you never said before that's right the association brings it out yes yes so it's good stuff so speaking of good stuff shall <laughs> we uh <laughs> use our air by three murugunar and i appreciate so much the work that he did over 30 years collecting these sayings of ramana 30 years it's just astonishing what he did yes yes so we're starting now from early in the book and of course you start with a benediction and here's the benediction the experience of our own existence which is the supreme reality jana itself shines as the mystic silence and is the true self behind the fictitious first person i may that absolute supreme self known as the feet be upon our heads nice one so thank you thank you ramana really the um idea that the first person i the empirical self is illusory is uh, very difficult to get across to most people i mean you really have to go mm-hmm. deep in meditation to see that for yourself and until then it's kind of just a theory right well uh as i have tried to talk about this with people certainly the usual response is uh people look at me like i'm crazy <laughs> <laughs> and uh that is a hint that they have never even considered this and uh right. it's not surprising the illusion the maya is so convincing that uh it takes a special effort to uh even start to uh imagine that it's just illusion at at first at first but when you start to observe this i uh the so-called i you start to see the cracks in the facade yes yes and it doesn't take clay. long it doesn't take <laughs> long 
to start to notice that if you uh, look and look seriously. That's why Atma Vichara. That's right. And I noticed that uh, Ramana doesn't wait around to uh, tell us things like this. Here we have uh, the what I feel like is one of the deepest truths that starts not in the first verse, but in the benediction before the first verse. Yeah, he doesn't wait. He doesn't, he doesn't mess around. Yes, and I appreciate that. So now we will continue. And uh, chapter one is on the truth or reality of the world. And verse 19 says, as cause alone is seen as its effect, and since consciousness, Brahman, which is the cause, is as clearly true as a namlaka fruit on one's palm, this vast universe, its effect, which is described in the scriptures as mere name and form, may also be called true. Now, this is a tough verse. Yes, let because me. we all know, or or we should know, that the material world is illusory because it's temporary, if nothing else. Yes. But yet, it has the feeling of reality when we look at it in a naive way or innocent way, because of the senses. Yes. And the senses are really the, way, the only way that we perceive this world. We can't perceive it directly. So we require the instruments of the senses. So, you know, this is a big problem in philosophy for thousands of years. That there is no way to actually prove the real reality or existence of the material world because any evidence that we might cite also comes from that world. Yes. If we go outside of the world, which the only way to do that is to go into Brahman, pure consciousness, the world <laughs> disappears. So there's no way to prove the existence of the world. And indeed, any attempt that we make only reinforces the fact that it's an illusion. Yet, the world manifests effortlessly from Brahman as a, an automatic phenomenon just based on its existence. So the existence, consciousness, and bliss, sat chit ananda of Brahman is reflected in the universe, the senses, the mind. And so we take that as real, even though it's a reflection. Just like when you look in the mirror, what you see is not you or your body. Right. It's simply, simply an image. And the same thing is true of the world. Yet we can say that, to carry out the simile, that the image in the mirror is, is real because it has a very good resemblance to the figure that it's reflecting. And the same is true of the reflection of Brahman in the senses and mind and so on. Well, one of the things I have noticed uh, in inquiry, uh, they tell you in inquiry uh, to look within, and uh, I think that looking within is kind of 
trying to look at consciousness with consciousness. I've heard of those words uh, for years, and when I do that, when I try to find consciousness, all I find are the effects of consciousness uh, that I think are the world. So I can't find this consciousness anywhere. And but who is looking? <laughs> That's right. Who is searching? That's right. Now, also, the other thing he says in this verse, which uh, I think is a big statement, he says, as consciousness alone, as seen as its effect, and since consciousness, which is the cause, etc., then he says uh, the its effect uh, may also be called true. And I read that as saying, since consciousness is real, there is a reality in uh, all of the effects of consciousness, the reality is not from the stuff, of course. The reality is my reality from consciousness. If you go in the desert and you see a mirage of water, it's real. It's a real mirage. It's not real water. But it's a real mirage, a real illusion. It really is an illusion. Yes. So uh, one of the things that has long been a kind of point of discussion between my wife and I is this exact thing about what is real and the reality of the world. And uh, I thought this verse was very interesting because it says in a different kind of way, uh, because I am real, that uh, what appears in consciousness is real, not of its own sake, if you will, but because I am real, all that I perceive is also real, even if it's imagination. So it's real imagination. Exactly. <laughs> so anyway, interesting stuff, I think. And Very. If, if these verses, again, I've studied uh, Ramana's teachings for 30 years, and if these verses are deep enough that it shows me th things that I haven't heard before, then I think, what wonderful stuff. That's why these we're doing verses, this. These particular verses are very rarely studied. Yes. I don't know many people who have read Guru Vachika Kovai. Yes, and for me, I hadn't read it. I was, uh, I've been aware of it for uh, very long, and the reason I haven't read it is it's so imposing. You know, 1,200 12, verses uh, means uh, to do it and read it seriously. That means how many of these verses can I take in deeply enough to meditate and experience because the only way these verses make any sense is through experience of, of them. So how long is it going to take to read, reflect, deeply meditate and experience each of these 1200 verses, I think, and so I don't even start. But you have to start somewhere. Yep, like we have this time. Yeah, the really good stuff is right in the beginning, too, like you pointed out. Yes. Well, it's not like write. you have to go through a long introduction. Yes, yes. Okay, so here we are. And now, 
where am I? Did I get lost again? Okay. No, no I didn't. And so this was... Um, excuse me. Well, there we are. That's what I'm trying to find. This was Sadhu Ohm's comment to that verse. Brahman has five aspects. Sat, Chit, Ananda, Nama, Rupa, which are being, awareness, bliss, name, and form. The first three aspects are real, being eternally self-shining, whereas name and form are unreal aspects, since they merely seem to exist, depending upon the illumination of Sat, Chit, Ananda. If, however, one sees the cause, Sat Chit Ananda, which is real, one may say, ignoring the apparent names and forms, that this universe is also real. And that's what we uh, just talked about. And uh, Sadhu Om, it turns out, sees it in the same way as we did. Well, what do you know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. What do you know? <laughs> so, uh, 21. For the sake of those ignorant ones who take the world, which appears before them as real and enjoyable, it becomes necessary for the scriptures to say that it's God's creation. But for those who have obtained unobstructed knowledge of the self, the world is seen merely as bondage-causing mental imagination. Indeed. A key phrase here is for those who have unobstructed vision of the self. Yes. Yes, which are, uh, that vision is uncommon. <laughs> it's just, it's just a vast understatement. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I'd prefer to understate things than to overstate them. <laughs> really? And so if, if I say it like that, and you say, that's, that's a vast understatement, it means you are confirming what I said and saying, he should say that more strongly. <laughs> Not really. And the, uh, while I was with Nomi, I spent time as a marketing executive and when I was with Nomi the first few years and after I had started to absorb some of the teaching, I noticed that in his uh, satsangs when he talked about the world isn't real, then new people coming to satsang, their eyes just glazed over. And uh, I went to him once and, uh, you know, said as a marketing guy that, you know, when you say these things, uh, it just is off-putting to the people here. And isn't there some other way that you can say it that won't uh, turn them off so much? And he said, no. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, basically what he's saying is uh, what is necessary is you have to learn and experience this and trying to sugarcoat it uh, or something like this doesn't actually help the process. No, it just delays things. Yes. What, it, what a statement like that does separates the men from the boys, as it were. Uh, those who are really serious from those who are just playing around in various ways. Taking a guru for ego decoration. Or yes, whatever. yes, 
Yes. But you know, uh, in the Vedas, there are two paths, the Nivrati Marg and the Poverty Marg, from which our word poverty comes. The Poverty Marg are those who take advantage of the Vedic sacrifices to earn material benefits. Ah, oh, okay. Whereas the Nivrati Marg are those who see the world as an illusion. And so they very much limit their participation. Mm -hmm. And that is actually the root of renunciation. It's not that we give up things for the sake of giving them up, but we give things up because we have lost our taste for them. Mm -hmm. And I think there's nothing more pathetic than a senior religious person of any stripe, you know, um, as they get older and they start to question their beliefs because they still fundamentally think of the world as an enjoyable thing, mm -hmm. an enjoyable place. <laughs> as Osho used to say, the priests ask me about sex. And the prostitutes ask me about God. So in other words, they have become uh, brahmanas or priests or renunciants or whatever for social prestige or because it's a good gig, you know, in, in their part of the world or their society. But in doing so, they have not uh, explored the world enough to see through the illusion. And I think this is essential and why I recommend for people to start at the beginning of the path and work through their karma yoga. Mm -hmm. Because by doing that, you will see very clearly that this world is just a false promise of enjoyment. You don't really get all this stuff that people think is enjoyable. Or even if you do get it, it's not satisfying. But it's still all right to enjoy the illusion as it's going by. Just don't hold on to it. Ah, yes. Like you I know, said, it's a real illusion. It's a real illusion. <laughs> I say that also as an example. Uh, my wife, uh, while in India, went to Chennai and went through a Vipassana course. And uh, part of it she had problem with when there was a monitor there saying, uh, walk on the path, don't step on the grass, and all of these rules. She had problems with the rules. She still ended up having good experience, even regardless of the problems, but when she was coming back, uh, she was riding in a car with another person who was uh, in the class, and they stopped uh, at a, a kind of well-known stand to get chai on the way back to Tiruvannamalai, and there was a bush with beautiful flowers there, and the woman wouldn't look at the bush because she was afraid that she would enjoy the flowers and somehow that was not on the path that she had just been instructed. And uh, I think she may have missed the point. I would agree. So it's, I think, I've said this before, if you're listening to a teacher and don't see some smiling and some laughter, then you'd be best not to go back again. Yeah, I would agree there too. Because what is the use of all this spiritual stuff if it doesn't make you happy? Yes. If it's a got to always be so serious, you know. Yes. Uh, I lose my taste for those kind of things. I, yes, very fast, very fast. 
and it also turns out from the standpoint of uh, the brain and brain chemistry when you experience things like the joy of meditation or even the joy of the flower that you're passing uh, those things release dopamine and the dopamine release then uh, enhances the changes that your brain makes every night when you rest and so uh, having a chance in meditation for example to say to yourself regardless of how the meditation was is this was good I'm going in the right way just that acknowledgement releases the dopamine and helps your brain change so the next day and the next year it's easier to do what you did so, I enjoy the flowers here very much. Yes. I'm just yes. looking out my window. I'm, I'm on the second floor. Well, the first floor, according to Indian culture. Yes. <laughs> and there's a, a beautiful Ashoka tree, you know, with the yellow blossoms. Yes. Just outside the window. And if I go down in the garden, oh, there's all kinds of flowers, jasmine, and, you know, all kinds of that I don't even know the name of. But they're beautiful. Yes. Because they're designed by goddess, by Shakti. And she is the original artist. So everything in this world is actually beautiful. And the way that the uh, laws of nature fit together and work as a flawless machine is just amazing. Yes. You know, it's a superhuman intelligence involved. But uh, if we don't appreciate that, I think we uh, run the risk of being ungrateful. Mm -hmm. Now, when I uh, walk, often when I walk, I uh, am meditating as I walk. And so I'm very much in the present moment and walking like that when I walk past the bush with the flower on it then uh, there is this moment of just spontaneous joy uh, from uh, the flower and when I am walk by it not in the present moment Maybe I notice the flower, maybe I don't notice the flower, certainly I don't notice the joy that is there. And it, I still, I like to walk and see flowers and be filled with joy. Yeah, why not? <laughs> That's right, why not? And the beauty is there. Yes. And someone might as well enjoy it. Yes, if only someone were there. Uh, verse 22. This world of empty names and forms, which are the imagination of the five senses and in appearance in the pure supreme self, should be understood to be the mysterious play of Maya, the mind which rises as if real from self, sat chit. Didn't Ramana sometimes advise people to look for the source of the thoughts? Yes. Where are they coming from? If you trace them back to the source, you find the self. Yes. Yes, I think it was not sometimes that he advised that. I think it was pretty regularly. Uh, <laughs> certainly that's one of the things that uh, was one of the verses in Who Am I, which was the first recorded teaching. So he's been saying that as long as he's been saying anything. <laughs> 
So I guess that is some time. And, you know, there's a message there for uh, those who are trying to practice. And the message is you don't have to be absorbed in all of the thoughts and imagination. Uh, what you need to do is just when you notice it, uh, stop. And you don't have to finish the stop, the thought. You just need to ask for whom is the thought. And the answer is obviously for me. There's no one there thinking anything. And then to turn that back into inquiry and saying, well, if it's for me, who am I? Really? And Why am I trying to convince myself that all of this is real? Uh-huh. And we put immense energy and time into this effort. Yes, yes. And that to try to justify the existence of the ego yes. in countless ways by yes. saying, this is mine, this is myself, this is who I am, this is mine, my possession, this is for me to enjoy or exploit yes. Yes. Yeah, in different ways. And this chatter in the mind goes on and on and on because it knows that it's an illusion down deep. So it has to keep uh, recreating the illusion to keep it in place. Yeah, Now, because otherwise it would just disappear. Yes. One of, <laughs> one of the other uh, interesting findings, I think, from neuroscience is they have located two parts of the brain that specifically uh, have the job of creating the sense of the individual. There's one part mm. of it that is creates the the kind of idea of the individual, and there's another part connected to the body and the body sense of I. And I think this is interesting because uh, since it shows, since the brain had to develop special mechanisms to erect this eye, that the eye isn't natural. The brain had to do all this special stuff to put it in place. And one of the things that uh, they see studying uh, people who have 10,000 hours and more of meditation is they see those parts of the brain have atrophied. Very interesting. Yes. So it goes the away. The Buddha figured this out thousands yes. of years ago. Yes. He get taught what is called the root sequence. And the root sequence is a mechanical machine of thoughts that happens every time we register an impression through any of the senses. And it goes through seven steps. And in those seven steps, I kind of described in summary a little bit though, that one sees something and when then one projects into it the idea of I, and then defines a relationship between that thing and I, so-called I, and finally claims ownership of it or the right to enjoy it. And this is a calculation that goes on literally you know, dozens of times a second. Uh -huh. for each compression from each of the senses. Uh -huh. And so the some of the Buddhist methods, like the Sayadaw method, involve a detailed observation of each impression and watching the mind as it turns that into a justification for I. Uh -huh. So uh, Buddha didn't need his functional MRI to determine all of this stuff. He was able to do it by careful and sustained self-investigation. Yes. Yeah.
you know, that's one of the things I think that uh, people do not adequately appreciate about the Buddha, which was his methodology. And his methodology is not some secret. It just requires careful, sustained investigation. It doesn't even require a teacher. What teacher did Buddha have other than... Uh, you know, what he was able to observe, and he was able somehow to release this ego hold enough to get deeper with it. Yeah, well, the somehow is by watching the breath. Yes, yes. Because the breath and the mind are so intimately associated. Yes. yes. Buddha calls the breath bodily fabrications. Okay, interesting. So by maintaining the breath, we maintain the body. Yes. And, and similarly, we, we have, there are mental fabrications called Shankara, which is how we create the ego. Okay. So the, the two processes go together and support each other. Yes. Now, Ramana also, I think, in Who Am I, talks about the connection between breath and mind. I didn't know that. So uh, the that detail has shown up in later teaching, teachings besides the Buddha. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Ramana read the Buddhist works. He read, uh, by that time, he had read uh, some of the Vedas and some of the scriptures, but he hadn't read mm -hmm. any of the Buddhist stuff. Well, every realized being really uh, teaches the same thing, just in different terminology. Maybe some of the details of the process is different. Right. But it's essentially the same truth. Well, what, whoever is teaching has to teach within the language construction and idea sets that are available in their culture. So... Right. Uh, the fact that you hear different words from different teachers trying to describe what is indescribable is not surprising. <laughs> what can you do except point to the method and say, all right, now do the work? Uh-huh, yes. Yes, whatever it is, we have to find it inside for ourselves regardless of uh, the teacher we have and what we've read and the people we're with or any of those things, uh, the process is within yourself and you have to do it. You've talked about the Buddha instructing people to go alone in the forest and uh, I think you know, he was teaching this also 2,500 years ago. What you do is by yourself, within yourself, and uh, so get to it. What are right. you waiting for? Do what for? has to be done. That's right. Do what has to be done. What has to be done now is go to the next slide, and I have to remember where we are. Then also, uh, Sadhu Om said about this, the origin of Maya, meaning that which is not, is unknown. It appears functioning in man as the mind and is inferred in God through his actions, sustenance, and dissolution of the whole universe. It ends on being seen to be non-existent when the truth is known. The seer, known as mind or I, and the seen, known as the world, rise and set simultaneously in self. If self sees itself through itself, it is self. If it sees itself through the mind or seer, it appears as the world or seen. There's a this lot. This is brilliant. Yes. 
Yes, and there is a lot in his uh, comment. Uh, the first thing uh, that he tells us is the definition of Maya, which is Maya is that which is not. We've heard of Maya as illusion, and that's just another way of saying the illusion. Then he goes on to say is when it's seen as non-existent, then the truth is known. And uh, for me, this is uh, another thing that I've used in my own meditation and experience uh, is when I see that not only is this ego some kind of fiction that uh, my mind put in place, but I can take that a little further and know not only is the ego not real now, it was never real. The ego never existed. And uh, when you see that, how much hold can this non-existent ego have on you? Really? Yes. But this is a jutta vana. Yes. The world is never born. It's uncreated. It simply appears. Yes doesn't really exist but you know I, you could use the example of a television or a movie show yes that the the real thing is the projector and the screen and the audience sitting in the theater but when the projector starts and the pictures start to flash across the screen people forget about the reality and become entranced by these transient images. Huh? But it's all very much dependent on the darkness in the theater. If the walls of the theater were open and the sunlight could come in, it would completely overwhelm and wash out the picture on the screen. And you would see that, oh, this is nonsense. This is nothing. So it's like that when we realize the self. That's like the sun coming into the theater and revealing the situation for what it is and washing out the illusion, which is far less powerful. So, again, when you know in the same way that you know that you exist that uh, this appearance of the ego is just an appearance and it is not who I am it is just some imagination that uh, the mind conjured up when you know that, the more you know it, for me, then just the happier I become. I can't explain, but it seems to be connected. Well, you won't take your desires seriously. Ah, and since okay. desires are the source of suffering, the suffering goes away and the natural happiness of the self is revealed. Okay, okay. Makes sense. Now let us continue with our guys. And we had said that. And so, uh, verse 25, forgetting self, which gives you the seer light to see, and being confused, do not run after this appearance the world that which you see, the appearance will disappear and is hence not real, but self, the source of you, the seer, 
can never disappear. So know that that alone is real. Tatvam asi that and recently we've been talking about the breathing uh, with hung saha and I looked up in the dictionary and saha is a synonym of tat which means that so they both are equivalent statements tat tomasi and so hung or hung sa. That now, alone is real. Yes. In this verse also, it's like what uh, we were talking about with Ramana and uh, thoughts. What uh, he's saying here is the same thing. Don't run after the appearance. Don't run after the thought. Instead, uh, ask yourself, for whom is this? And turn uh, that appearance into inquiry into the consciousness in which it appears. That's all. And Without the consciousness, there would be no appearance. Right. Yes. Yes. That's why he says that alone is real. And I also appreciate that he said in uh, this verse also, uh, again, he reminded you that uh, these things of the world appear and disappear. And because they appear and disappear, it's not who you are. It's not what is real. As you look, you start to notice that there is something always. And whatever you do, that something that is always, is always. It's there when you're happy. It's there when you're sad. It's there when your body is well. It's there when your body is sick. If you have uh, some other uh, extraordinary experience, it's there lighting up that extraordinary experience. If you have no experience and the mind is blank, it's there lighting up the blank of the mind. So for me, that's been a hint into my own reality and I start my inquiry as I've talked to you about with first uh, asking if I am if I exist and I've done this thousands of times and every time I asked and looked I did and so <laughs> <coughs> this has been one of the things that has really supported the deepening of my practice is that after a while even this slow clunky mind catches on after a few thousand times it sees that uh, there's a pattern there. Well my uh, spiritual master, uh, Prabhupada, I, Adi Guru, sometimes would get questions where people would doubt the existence of uh, transmigration <laughs> or reincarnation. And he would say, well, now you're a grown up, you're an adult, but you were a baby. And then you were a child, and then you were an adolescent. Where are those bodies now? And when you were in those bodies, you were the same person. You are the same being, the watcher, the seer. But the scene has changed. The body has changed. You are still the same. 
That means only consciousness is real. Everything yes. else changes. Yes, yes. And the definition of reality is what is constant, is one of the basis of this whole teaching. And that's something you really have to get to understand it. And for me, uh, this looking at my own existence was one of the things that supported that understanding. Well, it's the practical realization of it. Well, I couldn't help it. It's just what I needed to do. And I confirmed yeah. that I confirmed that with Nomi, and he thought it was a uh, good thing and a useful practice. When I lead uh, inquiries in one of the sessions that I do, I always start with uh, that, uh, do you exist? You exist, <laughs> and you know that you exist, and you don't have to, you don't get it from sensory knowledge or mental knowledge. You just know that you exist. Sometimes, it doesn't require any instrumentality. Yes. Sometimes I remind them, then, knowing this, you are already in this state deeper than mind and body. And that's a great way to start your inquiry. Hmm. Like Ramana says, self is already realized. Yes, yes. It's only we have to recognize it. Yes, yes. Now let us go, let us go on. I think this may be, there may be some further words about this. And here Ramana says, the deceptive, I am the body idea alone makes the world, which is an appearance of name and form, seem real, and thereby it at once binds itself with desires for the world. I think that describes the problem of the seeker that uh, needs to be overcome. And saying, really, the I am the body idea alone makes the world is a pretty big statement. Yeah. But it's also true. And we find out its truth when we let go of desires. Uh -huh. When we see that desires are really a false promise. That sometime in the future, I'm going to enjoy. Uh, right now I'm suffering, but in the future I'll enjoy and everything will be okay. <laughs> but it never is. Yes, to me a corollary of this is uh, the understanding that uh, kind of there is nothing that happens to you. Everything that you think happens to you is all just your own projection. And so the only thing you're seeing in the troubles of the world is the troubles in your own mind projected onto this poor innocent world. <laughs> it's like the news. Yes. I've pretty much given up reading the news because it's either titillation or um, trying to arouse a sense of outrage uh -huh. or anger yes. or moral indignation. Yes. That somebody way far away who has nothing to do with you did something bad. Yes. 
Yeah. Well, it's all it's all they just want clicks nowadays. The payoff for all of the media companies is uh, in the number of clicks they get. It's a very proven fact that that outrage and hatred and all these negative emotions drive engagement on social networks. Well, uh, in, even before social networks, in the uh, two centuries ago, when newspapers began, already there was the common knowledge, if it bleeds, it leads. <laughs> and so it's just the same. It's a social network. It's just kind of a slow one. That's right. Yes. <laughs> now, uh, when I was walking... Uh, my dog, I realized that before Facebook, uh, the dogs have their own social network. And <laughs> <laughs> you see them uh, using their social network as they S sniff around. Sniff book. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> And so maybe if we could get people to see that Facebook was uh, kind of like the dog sniffing, they would understand it differently. <laughs> it's exactly the same kind of thing. Yes, yes. That's Somebody why I... way over there on the other side of the world is doing something weird. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yes, yes. That's also why I thought that dog has uh, one of my spiritual t-shirts. He taught me uh -huh. about social networks. The other thing he really taught me was to enjoy the moment. Hmm. Because if you're with the dog and letting the dog have his head in freedom, then you're not going to walk wherever it was you thought you were going to walk at whatever pace you're going to walk. What you have to do is just enjoy the moment. So I thought that was a valuable lesson. In the Avaduta Gita, he mentions that one of his spiritual teachers is a dog. Ah, okay. Yeah, because the dog is satisfied with anything can sleep anywhere, Yes. Huh? doesn't try to maintain any possessions, and so on and so on. It's a beautiful description. Yes, yes. And, you know, we have to, if you're open, uh, the teaching is available from many sources. You just have to listen and notice and you know take it inside yeah i think a real sadhu sees everyone and everything as a potential teacher okay because the self is everywhere yes yes i've thought that that's one of the things that is convenient about it because anywhere that you go and you go deep enough what you will find is the self. And there is so, nothing else, really. And so maybe you find mm -hmm. the self by listening to the uh, teachings of Ramana and reflecting on it. Maybe you find it by taking the words of Buddha and seeing if you can find the experience yourself. Maybe you can find the self eating watermelon. Spitting out the seeds. <laughs> and then throwing away the rind. That's right. <laughs> and enjoying what's left without the seeds, the rind, or the watermelon. Very sweet. Yes. <laughs> so before we go, there is one more thing that I wanted to show you. And let me get it up. And this was a picture that I oh. found uh, yesterday of Ramana and Maruganar sitting there together. What a beautiful picture. Ramana looks so happy here. Yes. 
You know, usually the pictures that you see of him, he looks kind of mildly pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like he's having to put up with somebody's nonsense yes. for the sake of getting his message out. And here he's just, I think, you see this picture, he's with a friend and sitting and smiling with his friend. Uh, I yeah. would have to observe that uh, that's not entirely unlike the two of us talking back and forth and smiling. <laughs> yeah, because we're enjoying ourselves. Yes, yes. And so being, in many ways, Muruganar was Ramana's peer. Yes, yes. But he would never say it. He would never have said that. But I understand what you're saying. Well, wasn't it Muruganar who introduced him to the Vedic literature? Uh, uh, he had, I think Muruganar gave him some of those uh, introductions. I think Muruganar was also the one that named him no, it wasn't Muruganar who gave him his Ramana name, I don't think. I, don't I think remember. it was. It I was. think it was. Okay, it was. Okay, so. that's yeah. good. And he also came up with the mantra, Om Namo Bhagavate Ra Sri Ramanaya. Yes, yes. Uh, that uh, mantra is one that you will hear commonly at Ramanashram, of course. Where else? <laughs> oh, that is such a nectar picture. Yes, ah. yes. And so I think uh, that's what we have for today. It, as always, it's very good going through these verses and talking and uh, together enjoying these words and feeling them in your heart. Yeah, because there's really nothing that gives the happiness like inquiry into the self. Yes. That happiness you can have anywhere, anytime. It's unconditional. It's available everywhere, as you pointed out. Yes. It doesn't require any purchases or to believe in anything or to be a part of any organization. And it's, it's not uh, dependent upon body state. You can uh, be happy like that when uh, your back is hurting. Well, that reminds me of my recent experience. Yes. <laughs> it's getting better, by the way. Good, good. You know, uh, being in a body is sometimes a nuisance. I'm glad it's not me. Well, I'm sure you have your own trouble, bodily troubles. We all of do. Of course, of course. I'm at an age where when you get together with friends, sometimes the first thing that happens is the exchange of tales of body woes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> It reminds me that my body is old. Anyway. This weather brings up my lumbago. Like That's anything. right. <laughs> but uh, it also reminds me that uh, who I am is something that is never old and is never aged and uh, you know, is not touched by any of those body woes. Like Jesus said, lay up your treasures where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. Yes. So I think it means uh, don't hold your treasures in your hand or next to you. We have to or, look deeper. Or think of your body as one of your treasures. Yes. I don't think I'm going to think of this body as a treasure. <laughs> no, it's going to be a relief when it's finally over. Uh huh. We'll uh, see. We'll see. Well, it was for my uh, sannyas guru. Yes. 
Jnana Shakti. Yes. Uh, he had such a beautiful death because he didn't struggle at all. Yes. He didn't resist it. And uh, he just went deeper and deeper and deeper until he disappeared. Yes. Namaste, Richard. Namaste. Om Tatsat.